We're ready to go. Cool. So thank you everyone for being here. I am delighted to see this turn out and I'm really I'm really honored to be able to present this panel. Um, these are some of the experts who are thinking about this topic and you know, especially Citizen Lab has really led the way in the type of research that is looking at combining these sort of sociological and political aspects of human rights reporting with you know, measurement and research and you know, look, you know, understanding the technological components of how networks work and how the internet functions in our lives. So this is, this is really exciting for me. Um, I am Meredith Whitaker. I am a program manager at Google Research. And my focus is measurement and open data. So you know, that can be translated into trying to understand what's happening and trying to communicate it in a way that can be verified by others. So you're not taking my word for it. You're looking at what the facts are, and you're able to contest my claims and make your own conclusions. Um, when we're talking about measuring internet rights and openness, you can think of that sort of in terms of the traditional human rights model. So reporting has always been a part of that, gathering evidence, gathering accounts of human rights abuses, gather, you know, photographing evidence. Um, and as we you know, moved into a, a, a time in the world in which a lot of things began to happen online, in which a lot of you know, abuses may have been facilitated by things that happened with networks, things that happened online, you know, the question really became, how do we know? How do we gather the evidence we need to figure out what really happened to make the case for these types of abuses? And in that context, you can think of measuring, you can think of measurements as really evidence gathering, as a way of looking at these networks, looking at the bits on the wire, and you know, deducing from that um, what was happening and what was the impact on real humans in real time in the case of you know, rights and openness. So this is, this is connecting internet research with you know, human rights reporting, and I have on the panel a number of people who are thinking about this from a number of different angles. So I want to I want to start with Tim Maurer, who's a policy analyst at the Open Technology Institute, and can kind of you know, make a clear connection between you know, this type of research, which may seem very arcane to people, and and the real policy implications. So Tim, thank you, Maurer, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tim, and I'm here to represent the Open Technology Institute, which is part of this um, collaborative effort. And I work, I'm part of, the, just in terms of background information, the OTI is a um, nonpartisan public policy uh, think tank in Washington, D.C., in the United States. And I'm part of the policy team of the Open Technology Institute. So um, the reason why, I'm on, why I am on this panel is uh, because I can speak to the importance of open data and measuring um, the network for the policy work um, that is my day-to-day -day, um, work. And I've noticed since I've been involved in this space that um, the need for careful data is critically important to inform the policy development. Um, as some of you who might be, who have been in Washington might know, uh, there's a lot of policy debate that is not necessarily grounded in empirical research, but this is, I think, definitely an area where the more data you have, uh, the more uh, the better your policy um, recommendations. To make that more specific, to give you two specific examples from the work that me and my colleagues have been engaged in the last year or two, is um, first broadband policy. Um, so this kind of data that we're talking about on this panel can be used to verify whether consumers are, are actually getting what they pay for, and to find out if the net, by measuring the network whether the service that they pay companies is actually um, what they receive. And that, is, that has direct implications for our policy work, specifically when it comes to domestic policy in the United States, and has been a critical tool. I work specifically on export controls um, and looking into uh, whether existing export control regulations might need to be updated during the digital age. Um, as you know, a lot of what we've seen coming out of um, the certain countries after the Arab Spring, uh, a lot of the research that this lab has been done has shed light on new technologies that are used for surveillance and censorship. And one of the things that efforts like um, the people that I represent on this panel can help with is to help identify where those technologies are being used to then inform the policy recommendations and uh, analysis of what kind of changes might be necessary. But once those changes have taken place, 
how do you actually have a continuous research effort ongoing that helps policymakers uh, to decide what kind of technology should they be looking at? Because um, you know the spectrum of technology is so wide, but that if you have regulations that are overly broad, you end up having a potentially negative effect in terms of what you're trying to achieve. So having that empirical data is very important uh, to limit potential unanticipated and negative consequences. And that is why um, the Open Technology Institute has supported um, the measurement lab and other efforts that are also represented in the panel. And the MLab is a platform that allows totally open source measurement. So it's open data, platform and its open source measurement methodologies, which is why it also has, why we are trying to put this out there as a tool and resource for other researchers uh, that might not even be directly linked to this collaborative platform, but that have access to the data and can come up with their own research proposals and that is something where uh, Colin, uh, Colin's work is a prime example for the kind of effects that you can have by pursuing uh, data that is then openly available. There's uh, currently, <laughs> currently 800 terabytes of uh, uh, totally open data that's available. Some regular, some regulators are already using it, researchers are using it, and it's increasingly a valuable resource also for uh, policy analysts like myself. What's really the magic here is that, as I just uh, briefly alluded to, that because the data is openly available, you have other people looking at it and connected to their own research. And a little bit, and I think that's really a great example for anyone in the room who might be interested in using similar data to reach out uh, to any of us uh, later on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think that's a, that's a great introduction that really frames, you know, why is this important beyond simply publishing research papers, beyond doing research. And um, I'm one of the few technical voices here, uh, but I'm not going to make it too technical, so I think that would be what, uh, what Tim did the great job of introducing his measurement lab uh, started off as a, a way for researchers in uh, academia to uh, do really good global research, uh, collect all of the network performance data, and then access other people's network performance data. And uh, what we found in doing that is, is a number of side benefits that we didn't really expect uh, some of them learn about uh, later on the panel. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, some of the best practices for how we make sure we collect data and um, why it is important that it is uh, public and open. So, um, when policy changes are made in a vacuum, uh, it could be uh, at best misguided, at worst quite dangerous. Um, when you have policy changes that are informed by data, that can be really powerful. Now, when you have policy changes that are informed by open data, public data, now you have something that's very powerful and measurable by others. Uh, and then when you have policy changes that are informed by public and open data, and the analysis is done using open source, and the data collection is done using open source software, now you have something that is powerful, measurable, and verifiable by others. And that's the best kind of policy change you want to make. So um, there are really three steps to responsible uh, policy changes. Um, the first is collect a lot of data before making a policy change. This establishes a baseline for where, you know, where the world is. Then make a policy change. And then collect data using the same methods and compare them to your baseline. And this will tell you whether or not your policy change did what you expected it to do, or if there were any unexpected side effects. Now, you can take that methodology and you can imagine that you're collecting data in a sovereignty that is external to yours. Um, you collect data for some time to establish a baseline, and then over time you notice a change in the data compared to the baseline. And from that you can infer that there was a policy change in that sovereignty, even if it wasn't made public. Um, that policy change might be one of censorship, one of throttling, um, it could be some you know, other human rights violation, and that is the power of having the open data and open measurement and open analysis. So, um, a little bit more about what I do specifically. Um, I do a number of different uh, projects in network research, but uh, I, I spent most of my time in the measurement lab. And uh, a lot of my work is making sure that the data collected is internally consistent, uh, which allows for these kind of longitudinal studies. 
right? It, it allows for these long time baseline studies to happen. Uh, making sure the platform is broad and stable so that we have global coverage. Um, establishing mechanisms for easy access to this data. I mean, this is 800 terabytes of data, and it's worth repeating that is an awful lot of data. Uh, and it's not always obvious how to start analyzing it, how to start getting at it, how to find the needle in the haystack. Um, but one of the benefits of that data is that we don't often know what some of the signals in there are. Uh, and we rely on other people having access to that data to find those signals, and you'll learn a bit about that specifically. Um, and the other is to establish good practices for responsible collection and publishing of this data. And what do I mean by that? Well, this, this is actually where some tension comes in, because we want to make sure that this data is comprehensive. We want to make sure that this data is public, and we want to make it open. But when you start collecting data about uh, people's network practices or uh, their connections from their smartphones, it's very tempting to start collecting data about things like um, their location, and uh, you might want to assign every user a unique identifier so that you can track individual devices through the network performance data. This can be very powerful, but it immediately starts infringing on those people's privacy. So we have a constant tension between uh, wanting to get as much data and as good data as possible, but also making sure we're collecting it responsibly such that we don't expose people to danger. Um, I think that's everything that I wanted to say for now. Great. Um, before I pass it to Colin, can you tell me how many 160 gigabyte iPods? 800 terabytes. 5,000. There's a lot of iPods. Okay. Yeah, they got it. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, moving on. So I'm going to pass it now to Colin Anderson, and and we're sort of narrowing the scope now. So we we introduce the principles of open measurement. We've talked about the best practices and, and why this is so powerful in decision making. Um, and and now now you know, Colin Anderson is going to talk about some research he did using this data that really, as Dominic emphasized, was initially collected you know, to show network performance, really to show researchers who were interested in how to tune, how to understand the global network. Um, you know, to show them how to do that. This is technical data meant for technical people, and you know, by collecting it, by creating that baseline, um, you know, it, it gave Colin the opportunity to do some really stunning research. So I'll pass it to him. Yeah, they generally use iPods as a measurement of the capacity. We're working in the measurement. Uh, so I want to start off. There's a, another slide I think that should uh, be a lot more great. I have a little Okay. Uh, so, what's interesting is that the states are increasingly sophisticated in the ways that they control networks. Whereas in 2009, you would see articles and mechanisms uh, for states like, I, I generally focus on Iran, and so I'm going to use Iran as, as a specific example because Iran has, a, I think, a strong tradition of, of being more sophisticated, more aggressive, and in some ways more creative in the ways that they sense the internet. So, in 2009, the Iranian government struggled to deal with the popular uprising stemming out of an electoral uh, allegations of electoral fraud. The immediate response of the government was to shut down partisan communication centers. The mobile text messaging, for example, I think was down for 45 days within the first couple of months. And what you saw uh, across time was was that when there were specific protest moments, networks would be shut down. They would be more heavily censored they would be subject to greater degrees of interference. In, in the case of Iran, this became in, in some ways increasingly sophisticated, more narrow but more aggressive. So whereas you had that total network shutdown in 2009, in 2010 you would see interference with SSL, you would see interference with the Tor network, you would see DNS hijacking of particular things, you would see uh, DNS hijacking leading to a phishing site, uh, for Gmail using a compromised uh, search. This is an incre increasingly sophisticated and in a sort of morbid way kind of impressive. Uh, and so along this narrative, what you also saw with time of political moments is this, this idea that the internet was slow. And and I think that this is this is interesting because it's, it's pernicious because it's poor it's a it's a poor story, right? It's not tangible, it's just sort of 
you know, we all have experiences where the internet at our house is slow. But when you look at, at you know, this mechanism of speed throttling, it's actually an incredibly ag aggressive targeted move, right? Because if this isn't simply, you know, Comcast is slowing down my, my BitTorrent. This is my morning routine as I wake up, I turn on my anti-filtering tool. Maybe by the time the tea is done, it's connected. A couple of hours, uh, you know, as I'm making toast, uh, maybe maybe I've been able to log into Facebook, and by the time my breakfast is fully prepared, maybe I can get my, my news feed up on Facebook. And so this became increasingly the story associated with pre-planned protest moments. And so, you know, just to back up, we've seen that in some degrees what seems like an accelerating notion of disconnecting the internet with political events, but I would argue that, that what, for example, happened in Sudan uh, last month, what has happened in Syria a couple of months, is going to be a decrease in the phenomenon because what you get out of what you get out of throttling is is something that has been traditionally very difficult to measure externally. is a very boring story, uh, and then on top of that, sort of achieves the same purpose, right? Like the uh, it, it, it acknowledges in this pragmatic way the modern media landscape, which is is that a state can't censor news of violence against protesters, against indigenous populations. But today, that violence doesn't exist unless there are media uh, pictures, videos, and similar things. And all of those things take much more bandwidth to convey than exists when there's, there's a throttling regime. And so what, and, uh, so what we're able to take, for example, and uh, the beautiful thing about NDT it has a measurement lab is uh, largely because of uh, the network diagnostic test, which is bundled in with a number of applications. A very large portion of this uh, 5,000 iPods is NDT data. So because you, everyone loves, for example, BitTorrent, of which uh, um, NDT is bundled with a very popular BitTorrent, you have these nodes of measurement across the world. In Iran, there's a like 60 to 100 tests a day, and and in places that are you would uh, that, for example, a, a researcher like myself could never go in, you find thousands of tests even on a daily basis. And so what we have now is we have this this mechanism of accountability that was built in order for you know uh, in, incredibly like relatively uh, nuanced uh, issues of, of public policy. And so we can take this data, this measurement data, data which had, you know, initially was seemed to be conceived of to for FCC and for European Union type uh, purposes, and we can apply it. And so now we have a daily mechanism just to test uh, and detect the problem. And so what we're able to do in this case is, is go back across. You know, the beautiful thing is that this is this is more than three and a half years of data. So we have a very large portion of of the sort of uh, post-2009, post-Green Movement period, we have uh, sort of demonstrable evidence that we can go back and say, on this date, from this date, throttling occurred. It was, you know, X percentage decrease. It lasted for this long. And then on top of that, we can start even taking a look at who the privileged people were. And so to take for an example, uh, and I'll, I'll conclude with this. So like I said, Iran has has a, actually a very predictable censorship mechanism. Important dates, popular uh, moments of contention, and in, included in this is, is elections, especially an election, you know, this, this election that happened on, on June 14th was the, the first presidential election since the, the Green Movement. Uh, so you know that something is going to happen. And so based off of that, we can we can sit with this data and we can measure as the Iranian government institutes throttling the day of the official candidates being released and not relenting on it until the day after the election results were announced and stability hit. We can also take this for an advocacy point of view and then turn it into into real public uh, public tangible results. So this graph, for example, is the electoral period and what you is an over 70% decrease in, in aggregate bandwidth. This doesn't really begin to, to show some of the other uh, 
uh, forms of censorship that occurred, but it's very demonstrable over the controls that happened. And based off of this, based off of using peer-reviewed, methodological, citable sources, we can then take this, uh, take this graph, and this graph appears in an alternative form uh, in the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Iran's report that was released a couple of days ago. And there are something like two or three, three or four um, issues of, of internet censorship that are included in that. And two are built off of open data sources that have an open uh, methodologies that did exactly what we're talking about. And on top of this, last point, sorry, uh, the Iranian government reacts to every one of these reports very vehemently. And this is because they can sort of create doubt in, in the methodology and the data collection. In this case, what we can say is you can run the test. Here is the code. Here is the calculation. You can run the test. How do you? How can you disprove this data? It's difficult. And so this is what everything that, that uh, the, my previous two colleagues are, are speaking of. This is the power of that sort of thing. Right. Great, Colin. Thank you so much. Um, I think that really brings us home. And that that graph is pretty impressive. That is a quite a clip. Um, so now I want to move it on to sort of a. a discuss a, a different level of data, another type of data collection, um, and I'm really happy to introduce Marco Hagenwanning from the RIPE NCC. He's a technical advisor there, and he can talk about the way in which the data that RIPE collects um, led to you know, kind of accidental revelations um, about some activity that was happening in Pakistan, and then you know, talk about RIPE and the RIPE Atlas measurement projects generally. So. I have a video here that may or may not play, um, and I'm just going to try to put that on as sort of a background tableau for Marco, um, but that may not work. So Marco, just please take it away, and I will I'll work with it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, as Meredith says, I work for the NCC, the regional internet registry for Europe, the Middle East, and part of Central Asia. And in our business, we distribute and register IP addresses. Uh, Besides the core activity of, of doing that, we also got quite a substantial research department, and, and that, that came that, that came into existence out of a bit of curiosity. Uh, not only distribute IP addresses, not only register them, but but try to see how they're used on the internet, and, and that that sort of turned into a quest of mapping the internet at an infrastructure level. That that started 20 years ago with with a project to try and count the number of computers connected to the internet in the host count. Uh, that these days is impossible. We've got we've got other things now that, that look at the internet and, and if you uh, envision the internet as, as, as a patch blanket of independent networks that all interconnect, what we're primarily looking into and what we're measuring is how these connections are made, how the topology of the internet is formed and how it changes over time. Um, so we're not really looking at performance data and we're not really looking into censorship. That doesn't mean that we not occasionally see things in a form of serendipity uh, show up in our, on our measurements that, that uh, look or that indicate censorship. Um, now obvious examples that we see for instance are the, 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 the recent disconnects in Egypt and Syria where we simply see those networks disappear from the internet topology. They no longer show up in our data. Um, to give you a bit of a background, we've got uh, about three months of data uh, online just to help people troubleshoot network faults because that's our primary goal is help people to, to trace topology faults and then to find out what's happening. Uh, right now we've got just over 10 years of this data online, so we can build really long trends and then sometimes uh, after incidents occur we can go back and, and try to recreate what happened. So um, just to in quickly introduce this video, uh, a few years back uh, the decision was made in Pakistan to uh, block YouTube. Uh, that was in quite a rush and uh, sometimes people make mistakes. So the first thing is that uh, this was never bound to show up in our data. If 
everything would have worked out as planned uh, YouTube would have been cut off in uh, Pakistan and nobody else would have noticed it um, some misconfigurations uh, both in Pakistan and, and, and upstream of Pakistan uh, caused uh, YouTube to disappear for the whole world that, that, that delivers interesting data if you uh, later on go back and visualize what happens and, and, and with that we can then point out like where the mistakes or point out we can assume where mistakes were happening in the operation drive to put one. So if Meredith can do an attempt in I loading this video. I don't think I can. Okay. But um, maybe you can you know, there is a video here and uh, we can provide a link at the end uh, so you can watch it. I think you know I, I trust Mark and Marco's narrative styling to communicate with what happened. It was really really yeah. interesting. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the picture show, showing a snapshot of one of our visualization tools where uh, it, it, it's kind of tiny where every number represents a network of the in, on the internet. Uh, to the left, to the right, I think, is, is, is YouTube here, and to the left is Pakistan Telecom. And if you would play the video, uh, which would be gone, uh, uh, you sort of see that, that announcement you see. Uh, where, where Pakistan tried to pretend they were YouTube and that's, that's quite a common technical way of filtering something really quick and easy you pretend that you are those IP addresses and that means that all traffic redirects to you uh, that was meant to stay in Pakistan unfortunately it got out it got out to the world and, and as, as, as that message spread across the internet more and more networks decided oh yeah, YouTube is in Pakistan let's go there so all traffic that was directed at Google, that was directed at YouTube, ended up at Pakistan Telecom, which uh, A, couldn't handle the load, and obviously, of course, didn't have YouTube online, uh, causing uh, the rest of the world to panic and uh, probably go easily bored because uh, YouTube was down. Uh, I, I, yeah, it, it, it's a shame that we can't play it because it, it's a really nice visualization and you sort of slowly see, see the, the world pick up on it. Uh, we see Google respond and, and pretty fast uh, in trying to mitigate the uh, mitigate the error in, in making several other mes messages to the internet saying like no 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 we're really we're really YouTube and, and we see network some networks pick up on that and some networks don't and uh, yeah the end of the story is that uh, somewhere upstream of Pakistan uh, somebody gets a call and hey you made a typo corrects the error and you see pretty much Pakistan Telecom got up and the world restored uh, back to uh, the original plan that is YouTube in Google. Um, now we also have my other slide. Okay, because uh, this is one thing, topology. Uh, now looking at that and looking at the health of the internet we came up with a new plan and that's uh, called Ripe Atlas. There are many atlases in the world. This is ours. and. Um, We've got, and I've brought a few, these little tiny devices, which are tiny little Linux computers that connect to a network, can be in your home or in your data center, and can run really small measurements. Uh, the equipment is not smart or not big enough to do content analysis, we can't do performance measurements, but we can do things like ping, trace route, we can make a basic network connection to a web server, or send out a DNS request. Um, our goal is to have one sitting in each of these networks that make up the internet. There are 50,000 of them. Right now we've got uh, 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 up to close to 5,000 of these little devices online. Uh, the map every dot represents one of these devices and you already see a few red ones. Those are the ones that are at the moment we took the snapshot not responding. Uh, that could just be a network fault at home or a power outage or whatever. Um, now the interesting bit in this network is while we run some basic measurements to check for instance on our K-root service and, and uh, try to map topology changes on the internet, we build this as an open platform. People participating in the project can run their own measurements and that can be done on an individual basis if you host one of these machines or one of these little thingies at home, you get access, you collect points and with those points you can run your own measurements. 
uh, partners, people who step in and say, I sponsor, also get access to this, this measurement data. Um, and go in their own measurements, they can configure their own things. So you can start looking in, is this site blocked or not, or what type of DNS response do I get for a particular probe. Um, all that data is made public on the assumption that uh, if you use our data, we uh, require the results to be published and publicly available. That, that's pretty much our, our, our baseline. So. Uh, People who are interested in uh, hosting a probe, I've got two here, and I think I've got a few more uh, back at our booth. Uh, please contact me. And uh, other than that, I would say, yeah, for for research in room, uh, have have a look at this because uh, this, we're not really running the measurements ourselves. We're just building measurement infrastructure, and uh, hopefully, can others can can show what what can be done with this uh, with this information. Wonderful. Um. What I, what I love about the Pakistan story is it sort of makes such a clear connection between these these technical decisions that, you know, point zero 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 one percent of the world would understand or really care about, you know, and their impact on people, right? To make a decision like blocking YouTube, you have to make one of these technical decisions and, you know, that can be detected. That, that shows up when you're looking at the network the way that, right, um, now I'm going to sort of stay on the topic of Pakistan, but bring it uh, bring it bring it to a sort of a, a more local activist point of view. This is uh, Shahzad Ahmed, and he is with Bites with Freedom, as the slide will say. Um, and uh, and he has been doing measurements in Pakistan and using these measurements to facilitate human rights work on the ground. So. Um, I will let him. Uh, I will let him drive the slides here and explain this work. Well, that's what I said. That you do fiasco, but <laughs> it is still alive and. <laughs> Okay, uh, quickly, uh, Bites for All, uh, we are a, uh, an organization based in Pakistan, uh, have been uh, working uh, on internet censorship and surveillance issues since 2007. Uh, these are the few issues that we uh, work on. Uh, we have been part of Silicon uh, Labs Open uh, Network Initiative uh, since then, and we have been uh, working on all, all, all these different issues. And this is how we work. We conduct research uh, to document evidence or policy advocacy, policy change, and capacity building of citizens. So, uh, NetSweeper uh, story is, is is very interesting. How how it started? It actually started with a panic alarm among internet users in Pakistan when suddenly um, a lot of websites uh, started disappearing uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, so, uh, and then we saw that there's a very visible increase in the filtering, uh, particularly when they blocked Tumblr. That was the time uh, when uh, uh, there was a lot of panic. Uh, that's what is happening. So this uh, particular image that this uh, uh, website uh, is not accessible and served safely uh, was, the, was the point that uh, actually triggered uh, this uh, NetSweeper research. One of the researchers at the Citizen Lab, uh, he, he, could, he could sense that it's NetSweeper and it, then all the uh, efforts were directed towards this because he knew about NetSweeper deployment in other countries. Uh, so that is how it, it actually was started. Then uh, uh, they blocked a few Wikipedia pages as well. For example, we can't uh, uh, view uh, Wikipedia entry on hell uh, in, in Pakistan. Uh, then proxies also uh, started uh, disappearing. Uh, so these are the. Uh, uh, that is, in any case, we were already uh, running a campaign on a YouTube ban in Pakistan. So this was uh, part of our Access is My Right campaign. Uh, then uh, we 
we were we were we were also running a campaign around the, the same campaign uh, access is my right we were talking about censorship uh, issues as well and and then how i mean uh, net freedom strengthens democracy in the country so uh, with this background uh, when i mean we started looking at it that what is happening in pakistan only then uh, we started country level uh, activity so Uh, we developed a list of uh, URLs uh, uh, which were of national interest. National interest in the Pakistani context. Those were uh, news uh, websites, those were political uh, discourse, and and, and, and websites on uh, religion. Then there was a meta, a large um, list of uh, international significance uh, URLs as well. So these uh, list uh, two lists were then developed, and we then. Uh, 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 test on an uh, ONI tool that actually runs uh, on a different online connections on a different ISP and then helps network measurement. So using this uh, uh, system, uh, we can. Uh, I mean, it would actually go to each URL and assess that what the status is, and then eventually results are uploaded. Uploaded to uh, citizen labs uh, servers where researchers can have a further um, analysis uh, of, of this. So, sorry. so we came to know uh, through uh, through this uh, field testing that this uh, IP, um, which uh, you can see, uh, is is based at Pakistan Starry Communication uh, 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 Limited uh, uh, network in in Karachi. It's in Karachi, uh, and then we could actually reach up to the that speaker had been panel uh, 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 over here so that is how uh, i mean uh, looking at i mean this uh, network analysis and measurement helped us to actually pinpoint uh, what was happening and uh, that is how we could we could uh, we could assess so what we did with this report i mean actually when we were very sure that i mean this is this has happened and uh, this is happening uh, we uh, citizen lab uh, uh, Developed the research team uh, that was launched. Uh, that was launched in the media as well in Pakistan with huge uh, coverage as well. Uh, we 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 are doing public interest litigation uh, against Federation of Pakistan on two issues. Number one is uh, internet freedom, which actually includes uh, uh, YouTube banning in Pakistan. So YouTube is banned for about more than one year now in the country. So I mean, this is one case that we are fighting, and we have had 14 hearings of it already. Uh, and uh, just to give you a quick update on that, on 19 September, the court has uh, referred this case to uh, uh, larger bench uh, because of several uh, issues. Uh, I, I, I would believe that it's not very pleasant to talk about it. But then uh, let's hope that it somehow reaches uh, uh, pleasant end at some point, and uh, the, the platforms are unblocked. But Uh, so this particular research, when we submitted it to the Lahore High Court, where our um, uh, case is being heard, the government lawyer actually uh, rejected uh, this report, saying that this is fake and uh, uh, this is not acceptable. And and then then he said that the, this organization does not have this capacity, and how can they develop this? And they have made it up, and that they are maligning Pakistan. And he you know did this, and it just. So it out, and at then I mean he went further uh, beyond and said, okay, why not we should initiate a treason case against the petitioner uh, because I mean it is bringing bad name to the country, uh, and that it would it would unsettle anyone. But we we had very authentic and a uh, uh, proper research uh, backing us uh, with with proper data. Uh, and and luckily the judge himself had seen this report on the website of citizen lab so he dealt with him accordingly as as he as he had to uh, so so that was a, a little uh, interesting um, uh, thing so we we did this uh, poster as well uh, for the for the campaign uh, so uh, so so that's the quick story uh, i mean just wanted to say that it's uh, that these kinds of uh, data research analysis are extremely important For effective uh, um, uh, policy advocacy uh, in, in in all because situation is changing. Not more many countries are now heading towards controlling the internet and filtering and you know it's it's not only Pakistan is a democratic country, it's a democratic society. I'm proud of it, but still they're doing it. So 
there are uh, repressive regimes as well. They would do it more. So I mean, it is extremely important that I mean we we know of these uh, cases and we know how to go about it and when to go with proper research and be and then talk to and face these uh, people, uh, the policy makers or the, uh, or, 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 or the judges in the court. Uh, it makes your case very strong and uh, it, 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 it helps in, in, in various ways. Thank you so much, Mr. Prad. That was it. <laughs> ah, yeah, that really brought it home and thank you for your work there. Um, now we're going to come into the present um, and really you know, talk about some of the work that Citizen Lab is doing, you know, has been doing for years and has been doing this week. Um, this is not theoretical. Um, we're going to discuss some of the results from their measurements at IGF and in Bali, looking at network practices here right now. Um, what are the differences between the networks that we as IGF attendees can access and the networks that are available to people who live here on the ground? Um, and I will let Masashi and Daru who work with Citizen Lab and have been doing these measurements, um, you know, talk about them and I think just give an overview of some of Citizen Lab's work over time because I think that really helps frame where we are today. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Meredith. Just to get started, I just want to zoom out for a second and talk about our general research area, which is trying to understand information controls and we do this with our partners, such as Vice for All, Daru, members of the Cyber Stewards Network that have joined us at the ITF this year. And just to give a definition of information controls, uh, we consider them broadly as actions conducted in and through information communication technologies that seek to deny, disrupt, manipulate, or monitor information for political ends. So what does that mean? Here's some examples of, of information controls that we'll just go through the different categories. This is by no means comprehensive, but just to show some of the diversity of the issues that we're looking at around the world. So today we've been talking a lot about information denial, particularly around the internet filtering, throttling, uh, other ways that this can be done, denial of service attacks, uh, also non-technical means, law and regulation, broad, broad use of libel, slander law in some countries. Uh, and the objective of all these things is to deny information from reaching the, the user, and that can be done for a variety of different means and a variety of different rationales. Uh, that's not the only kind of information control. There are also controls that seek to manipulate or project information. This can be done by compromising a website, changing its visual appearance to have content that might go against the message that a site has. If it's, for example, a site of an activist group, all of a sudden the message there is against one of their campaigns or trying to smear them. Uh, that can also be done to government sites. Uh, it could also be through online propaganda, whether that's trying to project a message that perhaps a pro-government regime on social media or spamming comments on a news website. Uh, so that's not to deny the information, but to manipulate the discourse that's happening in our online sphere. Uh, another area that uh, we are very concerned with and do a lot of research on is information monitoring or surveillance. And just briefly, you can consider two kinds of uh, monitoring. So we're passive, we're trying to collect as much information as possible, and the recent NSA revelation kind of shine a light on how that might operate, at least in one country. And others are more directed, such as targeted malware attacks against specific So while there are multiple controls uh, that are being exercised, there are also multiple actors that have to be considered. There are states, there are civil society, there are illicit networks, terrorist groups, cyber criminals, other groups out there. And there's also the private sector. And each one of these actors have a different place in political, legal, and technical systems. And each one of them are trying to assert different agendas and have different influences over these systems. So what's important is that to understand these different controls and these different actors, we really have to take a holistic approach and use some mixed methods research um, techniques ranging from technical measurements that we've talked a lot about today with network measurements and, and other means of forensics. And uh, what we do in the lab is try to combine that with social science theory and methodologies and also legal and policy analysis. So Indonesia is a really good example of why you require this mixed method research approach to understand the situation here in terms of information. So, um, just to first start with the sense of the technical infrastructure, Indonesia is a little bit complicated. So there's over 300 internet service providers here. Uh, what this diagram shows is uh, 
in the red, those are uh, Indonesian uh, autonomous systems, and, uh, and the different colors are uh, our foreign systems, uh, which are under the administration of particular entities or authorities. So the middle layer of nodes uh, are Indonesian networks that have upstream connectivity to foreign networks, which are on top. And uh, so th the point here is that this is very decentralized. And in fact, in 2012, uh, Renesis put um, out a blog noting that uh, uh, due to this decentralization, Indonesia is likely to be extremely resilient to internet disconnection, which is interesting. So um, using the uh, general methodology that Shazad explained, we've been doing network measurements in Indonesia for some time. Um, um, <laughs> we've been doing network measurements in Indonesia for some time. This shows a summary of our measurements from 2008 to 2010. And uh, the takeaway here, and there's a, a, a longer paper if you're interested in this methodology and also the data is available, is, is that just as the technical infrastructure is decentralized, uh, so too are the techniques and uh, means used to filter content. In Indonesia, there is a general focus on the filtration of pornography and gambling content, but there are other content uh, filters as well, and we'll get, that, get into that in a minute. So without going into the details of this graph, you can just see that across these different ISPs, uh, there's different means of filtering. So um, just as the infrastructure is decentralized, so too are the controls. So just to bring it down to where we are here at the IGF, um, we've been, as Meredith mentioned, running a project this week on trying to monitor information controls in and around the IGF itself, um, the venue, looking also at policy practices and, and the, the, the debates that have been shaping this event, and taking this as an opportunity to explore and analyze uh, wider issues around internet censorship and surveillance in Indonesia. And uh, I'm very happy today to be joined by my colleague Daru, who will explain to you how exactly the networks uh, that you've all been using for the last week work. So, uh, the internet in this space, the host can be signed between the host IGF and when and you and when this that open internet connection available and provided. The the primary the primary wireless network is by as IGF twenty thirteen and also IGF twenty thirteen BSD for five gigahertz. And two other network is IGF twenty thirteen BP like MP. And IDF and And this ISP has two, two largest providers in Indonesia. So uh, we ran some uh, measurements during this week to try to understand uh, how these networks work and to verify whether the IGF uh, uh, network that Daru explained um, uh, was uh, free filtering. And it was. However, the, the other two that depend on the two largest internet service providers here uh, have the same controls as they were elsewhere in the country. So if you were on um, yeah, the one on the bottom here, IGF 2013 at Wi-Fi.id, and you went to particular websites, uh, your content would resolve to uh, one IP address, you'd be directed to this block page, uh, which is the website for um, Trust Positive. Uh, you might have seen their booth outside of the Ministry of uh, ICT, so we're getting into details uh, from Daru. Of, um, of what that means. So we tested a sample of 1,387 URLs and found that 197 of those URLs uh, were blocked through DNS tampering. So, uh, and a, a variety of content was blocked, including pornography, but also LGBT content, independent media sites, critical religious content, and uh, circumvention in the non -wise. network offered by uh, Indosat. Uh, we tested the same um, sample of URLs, found that 197 uh, are filtered. Uh, again, a variety of content, including OCT, uh, independent media sites, uh, for religious content. Uh, so this is just a breakdown of um, the different content that uh, we found blocked on these networks. But also, as a means of comparison, uh, we ran measurements on another network, I called 3, which uh, we did through uh, just a, a 3G connection uh, to other Phone. And so you can see the, the focus here, uh, the, the, the top bar there is pornography, uh, we go through other um, categories um, related to uh, the social issues, and you can see a lot of overlap there in terms of uh, 
focused on pornography can you cite um, uh, here you see uh, here you see uh, political sites things dealing with political reform women's rights free speech against the overlap between these uh, these are uh, these are uh, content related to internet tools, anonymizers, e-content, email providers, and so forth. So just to give a sense of the overlap between these, um, the, the highly decentralized uh, environment of, of Indonesia means that there can be a variation in how content is filtered between ISPs. Uh, however, our results, just with these three ISPs out of the 300 that are available uh, in this country, uh, do show some uh, variation in filtering. There is a general overlap in terms of the content filtered. Uh, there is definitely a focus on pornography, um, but uh, we also see um, uh, uh, the, the blocking of non-pornographic LGBT content. And one notable area of difference is uh, anonymizers and circumvention tools, which we saw more heavily filtered on the telecom net, uh, network than uh, the other two. So th that gives you a sense of the network measurements that we've done, again, in a, in a limited sample of what we were able to do this week. But just with technical measurements alone, that doesn't tell the full story. And you really have to understand uh, the policy dimensions, the legal dimensions, and what civil society has been doing in this country. And uh, to do that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Gary. When we thought about uh, this and the other issue, we have to move back to 2008, when the electronic information and transmission law limits freedom of expression to the information. And one paragraph, on that law limit uh, dissemination of information that invokes hatred and hostility towards individual groups of people based on race, ethnicity, and also religion. So, if you if we see back on this blog content on the left, we will see LGBT websites and social networks that you know, maybe uh, including on this. Regulation has been blocked. Another regulation is anti pornography law, which was proposed in October 2008. I mean, opposition from various groups consider law threat to cultural diversity and the right of minority. The law criminalization, uh, uh, sorry, the law criminalized degradation and dissemination of and use of pornography. And it states that any person found distributing pornography will face up 12 years imprisonment and fine like 6 million, 6 million rupiah. Anti pornography law also aggressively promoted and implemented by many ESPN internet cafe in 2010. That's the first stage of this then as well. And after that, um, become the NS Nawala, and now we have a trust positive. So, but because this is all ice, and we have like Very difficult if you get blocked by one ISP and another ISP is not, and you want a remedy. It's quite difficult. So, uh, we'll be publishing uh, reports on, on three issues looking at the infrastructure and governance environment of Indonesia, uh, analyzing content controls, and also exploring uh, surveillance uh, by the end of uh, today. So, you can have much more details on it, and I'd uh, love to. Uh, open Thank you so much. Um, I think that's a lot to take in. Um, there are many technical terms mixed with political narrative. Um, please ask questions to clarify anything. Um, we will we will put up links to where to reach the data, you know, where to watch the video. Um, but I would, you know, again, let the echo Masashi and open the floor to questions. After I thank the panel, this was really really stellar. I'm really grateful for you guys to be here for all the hard work you did that brought you here. Um, and especially the Citizen Labs has been really leading the charge on this, this type of research, this you know, database analysis, 
of ground truth. Um, so thank you. Um, does anyone have questions? I see Ali. Uh, 
we specifically try and, uh, well, we don't try, we specifically do not aggregate the data. So it is raw data, unaggregated, unfiltered, unprocessed, uh, because in that way there's no risk of being accused of um, manipulation or, you know, it, it, again, it strengthens cases when, when you can just show that the path of data has led you to uh, exposure to problems. Yeah. Just in re uh, the question with regards to the lawyers, and I think what this panel will say is, especially the approach that the lab has taken, is that it's important to have the data and to have verifiable data, but you need to also have that intermediary step of educating people about the utility of that new data and how to interpret the trends. One way that this panel has been doing that very successfully is working with. Uh, Context to make that translation exercise. But similar to when we saw like fingerprinting becoming a new one in the law, which is why I was familiar, you have to have that. That will take time. And we can accelerate that by working and specifically reaching out to like lawyers, law schools, and making them aware of these new tools and evidence that is available. Um, but it will take time and also um, obviously resources. Um, on this note, I would also like to mention. A lot of talk about digital surveillance in different countries, and uh, really there is a special theme of uh, surveillance here in, uh, and at IGF as well. Uh, so, uh, if uh, uh, the Finn Fisher report uh, that was published by Citizen Lab, uh, we didn't uh, we didn't have it, we didn't have that research, we were not able to uh, uh, get into another public interest litigation against the government of Pakistan. The case that we have specifically. Uh, lodged against the government on surveillance and on beneficiary and how it is being used. So it was it was totally uh, based on that one report that we could take it and then the government admit, uh, so uh, the court admitted it and admit the, though the process is still not initiated on that, uh, there's still, I mean, we still have to have first hearing, a second hearing of it, but then, uh, yeah, that was, that that is all, uh, another example that how research can be used by activists. So, so we're hearing, you've mentioned NetSuper, you've mentioned Sin Fisher, and I think this is a great way to sort of bring this back around to some of the work Tim is doing. Um, what, what is a Sin Fisher? What is a NetSuper? Um, and, you know, how do we connect it to maybe a more complicated but more realistic ecosystem? So this touch is now in the work um, that was over the last citizen uh, lab, so we should please uh, chime in here. Um, we started looking uh, in a little bit more systematic, systematic manner into um, tools that have been used for censorship and surveillance and that were, uh, are now coming because of the new technology that is available. And Pin Fisher is a prime example um, for software that has been used to uh, spy in countries like Bahrain, but also in countries that are subject to uh, sanctions, at least in the US context. Um, and in terms of the work that we are doing is using the research that the Citizen Lab and other groups have produced in terms of analyzing the technology um, and then tying that to our policy uh, analysis by looking at what existing, um, what is part of already the export control regime and in the U.S. you have certain provisions with regard to crime controls where you might be able to make that analogy that already allow a review of such technology but also where are the gaps and that's where the uh, analyzing and taking apart what technology are we actually talking about is critically important because it allows us to then look what kind of language in the existing policy uh, already could be, uh, already matches uh, the description of that technology and to what degree are there limits. And Colin might be, uh, might want to add to that a little bit as well because they have been doing a lot of work about it. Um, and we see Finn Fisher was one example um, we have now with this measurement uh, data that we talked about here, the ability to actually go a little deeper and find out where um, those technologies occur in what countries, um, and then find out also what kind of list of countries or what kind of indicators do we need to use to apply to say, for this specific country, so we want to review whether this technology uh, should be used uh, there or not. And I'm happy to talk more. to add a bit of reference to uh, some of the research we've done on these tools, so particularly around uh, 
Ben Fisher, which is marketed as a governmental IT intrusion, the way that it's described by Gannon International, the company that sells it and markets it. And uh, they claim that it's only sold to uh, law enforcement agencies and other governmental agencies uh, for programs such as lawful access, um, uh, quote unquote. Uh, however, as, as Tim mentioned, uh, we found it directly targeting activists uh, in Bahrain and Bahraini activists uh, who live in the United States. And um, through some um, measurement studies uh, that uh, our group and colleagues have done, have uh, detected the presence of command and control servers, so the servers that send commands uh, to clients that are infected with uh, FinSpy, which is uh, part of the FinFisher suite, in, in over 36 countries, including uh, here in Indonesia. And we uh, will speak about that um, in a blog post uh, that's going to be published later today. Uh, importantly, the presence of a, a command and control server within a country does not necessarily imply that uh, the government uh, of that country has uh, owns or operates um, in Fisher. However, it opens some very interesting questions. And you know, as Shazad mentioned, we also found a presence in Pakistan. And I think you know this is an important aspect of this research that really has to be uh, community driven. And uh, so you know, we're university-based researchers. We can create an evidence layer and uh, help inform people about what's happening out there. But we really uh, depend on our partners. Um, like Bites for All and others, to, to take that evidence and, and run with it and try to ask these questions uh, of their governments and, and, and otherwise of you know, why uh, are these devices being detected on these networks? What does it mean for broader implications uh, for privacy of, of citizens in those countries? And, and just quickly on, on NetSweeper, uh, NetSweeper is a software used uh, for internet filtering developed in uh, Guelph, Ontario. We're based in Toronto, Ontario, so they're kind of neighbors of us. And uh, we found it, um, of course, in Pakistan, but also uh, being used to filter um, political and human rights content across countries in the Middle East. And we actually found an installation uh, this week in uh, Nice in Indonesia, uh, which is interesting. And that just further goes to the point of how decentralized uh, filtering practices and techniques are, are in Indonesia. And while you have programs like uh, Trust Positive and Nawala that are trying to centralize it, there's a lot of variation uh, between the ISPs. Great, thank you. Um, I think we may have some remote questions, and, and I think we'll take them, but I also want to we leave this conversation with the question of, or, or with the, the question of where is uh, where is Fisher coming from? Right? Like these, we've talked about Pakistan, we've talked about Iran, we've talked about Indonesia, um, but these are using tools that you know I think him and others are well aware may not. Come. I, I, okay. um, and then a remote question. So we have Karen Wu here from Malaysia. She has two questions. The first is for Colin. I understand that there is four terabytes of data that is collected. My question is, how do you ensure that the data is anonymized so that users cannot be identified? And the second is for Marco. I understand that you have computers that collect data on the networks on the internet to understand more of the internet. My question is whether this study is limited to public networks or does it include private networks? So um, this is what I was saying about the responsible collection of data. Um, we spend a lot of time with that, um, with the researchers that write the measurement tools that uh, run the experiments and provide the data that we uh, manage in the measurement lab. Um, we spend a lot of time with them to make sure that the data they're collecting is um, anonymous. And this is one of the, the things I was mentioning earlier with the responsible collection where uh, we've had researchers ask us um, if we would uh, collect and, and uh, process and, 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 sorry, and store data which had included uh, problematic uh, data points like geolocation, like uh, unique IDs, uh, like the, uh, I can't even think of the list, but uh, specifically with mobile data industry. We've had people come to us very, very quickly.
not participating in censorship research, that this was a normal functionality of the initial tool. Now, the more that you get into to data collection that is politicized, the more that this becomes, becomes a, a larger question than sometimes, sometimes even the development of the tool. And so if you take, for example, if you look for the development uh, history of uh, Winnie Pro, which is a, an upcoming and slowly developing, uh, developing censorship assessment framework, this is this is this has been at the core of a lot of a lot of the development. And what you start to do is you start to have to sort of fuzz uh, fuzz your data to be non-specific. To say that we're going to report the name of the network, but not necessarily the IP address, or that we might round off the time. And so uh, there is a very large now I think uh, set of strongly emphasize that this is a debate in which there is a strong need for challenge at every point that anyone makes a decision on what level of data to collect. And I would invite everyone in the room uh, to, to participate in the debate because uh, a small amount of voices leads to group think, which leads to bad decisions and missing things that might potentially be possible. Questions you brought up earlier, I just want to be more the what the, 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 the definition of the public in the end. So it's, it's, it's really hard to say where, where we're looking at, but the, um, the, the things we see in our measurements are the networks that interact with other networks. I think in general, we want to say that's the public in the end. So that's the isolated network. Right? So, and, and to follow up on that, I that might be interesting for the audience um, is to understand why Wright started the Atlas project. Why was this data initially interesting and then, you know, it may have ancillary benefits like you know, accidentally showing what happened in Pakistan, but the original purpose of the data. The original, the original purpose of the data was really to, to, to see how topology changes over the internet, to see cable breaks, to find and isolate faults. That's, that's I think, my, one of my goals that we started it for. It, it generally evolved in the system, what we now have, that, that it looks a lot more interesting data. But, but the primary purpose for us is, is about the technical operations of the internet. Um, locate faults, trying to make the internet more efficient, trying to make the internet more resilient. That's, that's the, 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 the core goal of our research.
question and we'll just get that data that you collect. Well, I think, I think you may have just hit on the question that really you know, emphasizes Colin's attention. Dominic, maybe you can talk about what is what is the delta between dream data, uh, data that's possible, and, and what do we have now in relation to each of those? Um, so, in terms of um, studying pure network things, um, which is where you know, my focus really is, dream data is every possible bit of information about the device in the internet, and it's upstream. There are many reasons why I would never push it, <laughs> uh, but that would be ideal because we, we generally don't know what the um, factors are that cause network performance issues. Um, you know, when you're specifically mobile, let's say, when you're mobile, does the battery level matter, right? Um, which radio is active? Uh, you would like to know what, you know, um, after, um, what other applications are running at the time when the network is ready to take are they running you know, specific applications? And this is, I'm sure, if you can imagine, raw in the physical thing, because you, know, you start to be able to fingerprint, which is always a problem. Um, but you also start to you know, see much more information about the individual that really is irrelevant to the network. So we are a very long way, uh, which is actually a good thing. Um, but it doesn't limit our ability to get good, or rather, That answers it. I think you know, we're, something we're that might be. We're a very long be, way from the ideal for that. Yeah, okay. I think Marco and Colin have a comment, and that's something that might be interesting to address. Is just you know, it seems evident here that we can't say a lot about networks with the data that we have. Um, what is interesting? What can we say that we want to be able to say, irrespective of what data? We have. So I think for the original question, Marco. I think limits us in, in, in where we can measure and what we can see. And uh, it would be frankly to answer the question. Uh, as, as I said in my introduction, our, our ultimate dream goal is to have one of these probes in every network that makes up the internet. So there are two things that I'd like to see. One is the proliferation of just more data based on the assessment. If you look at, if you recall the Probably you'll see a lot of jitter, and that's based on the fact that you're definitely stressing the most of what you have uh, based off of the data. And so the more that you have devices and software applications that are reporting this complex data to the network, the more that you get uh, assurances on what you're saying is right, the more that it's just even that sort of graph. And the second, the, the second thing that I would talk about is I would make reference to. Uh, something that was quite unprecedented, which is uh, a project called uh, the Internet Lenses, uh, which was a which is a product that was collected during 2012 using highly un unethical mechanisms to basically take a snapshot of the entire Internet uh, over the course of a couple of days. What you got out of that was a, a, a sense of every device, yeah, every device constituting a public Based off of that, a lot of really solid research has been done there. For example, uh, collaboration uh, with uh, with Citizen Lab, finding a very what I assume is a very large portion of the network devices on the internet, and further uh, further demonstrating how lax export controls have uh, led to the flow of these devices in a place where U.S. comprehensive sanctions should have. Uh, so that is that is one of those mechanisms where you have a large set of data uh, leading to a very solid, very tangible public policy outcome in your own discussion. The problem with the citizen lab is these sorts of 
data measurements. First off, reflected on ethically, and second off, exposes some of the, uh, the fragile nature of the internet. Uh, I, I, I'm guessing that more than uh, legitimate academic research, in some ways, probably the internet census was used for abuse, such as over proxies uh, and exploitable devices and these sorts of things. Uh, we have now, for example, a very beautiful tool that was put out. I encourage you to look at the internet census. I also map allows you to port scan the internet in effectively 45 minutes if you have a sweet academic connection if you go by a, a computer on a, a dedicated server, you can get it in seven hours. Figuring that uh, back in the day we used to talk about this sort of stuff in six weeks at most, that's a, that's a pretty good time saver. This narrows the internet all the time, right? The internet is a much smaller place. The problem is, is that uh, more often than not, the internet is a much smaller place for people who want to break the internet. Uh, and so I think that that's one of the contentions, even if, if I maybe worded it a little bit less than that, probably concerns. That's one of the contentions that we have to deal with too, right? Can show how how the internet looks like there are sometimes people who want to use that for engineering. So I could have about another answer, actually, which is slightly different. Um, is I would like to see more data from different areas of the world. Um, one of the things that we struggle with, um, especially in some of the countries that we're interested in, is uh, a lack of samples, a lack of data. Um, because we rely on client-side probes in various countries running these tests. And so for places like North America, we have excellent data, great coverage, more data than you know, ever want. We see patterns in the data down to minutes of the day. Uh, when you're looking at samples of the ground, you're looking at maybe a couple of samples of the ground, which really is not enough to be able to make, um, unless you see you know, the problem drop by over 7%, where it's fairly conclusive, it's very hard to see subtle changes. And so a lot more data in uh, other areas of the world a lot more clients running things like the right path and spreading even further so that we get better global coverage of the global internet. Huge. So I'll make a quick question. What is a client side probe running in test? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Measurement Lab is a, uh, a global platform, a bunch of servers running uh, all over the world uh, in various data centers and uh, cupboards. Um, and those servers are basically just listening for connections. Um, what we have on the other end of that connection are clients. So that could be someone with a laptop running a program from the command line. Uh, it could be someone running BitTorrent, which is you know uh, the other end of a test. And what BitTorrent will do is it will find one of our servers, it will run a test against it, it will find out what the truth it is, and it will report that to us. Or something like uh, MobiPlug, a, an Android application that you can run on your phone that does speed testing of your connection. And so those are all client-side tests that run against the server side, which is this suite of servers that come online. So these are people, devices, and data servers. I could just add, just uh, I think everything my colleagues have said about rigorous technical measurements and you know, new tools that are out there is very exciting. But you know, as a social scientist, my dream data set is a little bit different and perhaps a bit more abstract. So I would like to see a, you know, a comparative data set of uh, the bidirectional relationship between political events and information controls that brings in these rigorous technical measurements um, that were spoken about, but also looks at the legal policy environments in which these happen and what the impacts of those controls were on political events such as elections, political sensitive anniversaries, and looking at a longitudinal analysis of that, how we, can we understand how governments have reacted to pressures such as terrorism, such as, um, such as dissent in their country and, and otherwise, and what is the impact then on human rights, and how can we then work with our partners uh, to try to raise awareness around that and try to understand what some counter-narratives um, to those responses can be, and, and, and document that with, with evidence, uh, drawing in both um, the measurements again, legal policy analysis, and, and trying to understand the greater implications of this on human rights and international relations. Great point. So we have about five minutes left. 
Um, I, I know Colin has a comment he wants to make. I want to see if there are any pressing questions from the audience, and then you know, Colin's comment, and then go through some closing statements. Um, optional. So I, I see a hand over there. Um, Walid al Sakaf, affiliated somehow with the Incidium Lab uh, through the Cyber Stewards Network. I work on circumvention um, ideas and tools for the Middle East in particular. I mean, I've come to read the news about UProxy, one of the Google ideas that have come about uh, in which you allow um, US users in assisting Iranian users. So this appears to be somewhat of a, a paradigm shift in having Google more involved in helping human rights activists. I mean, is this a trend that will continue and whether this will move on to other countries around the world? And another question is, do you find that uh, mapping censored web or filtered websites through a, perhaps a plugin on a browser uh, or some other solution that would give comprehensive data to many of us around the world trying to understand the phenomenon of filtering useful? So I can I can attempt to answer the Google-related question. Um, unfortunately, I work in a fairly narrow field of research. I don't work with ideas, um, but I am aware of the project. I think one of the things to emphasize here is that you know, freedom of expression is really important to a number of people at Google, um, and that this was the, the UProxy project was actually developed at Google. This was support given to a group at the University of Washington, a group of uh, a group that was developing the Lanswim project, um, and, you know, and, and that this is an ecosystem of development that has existed for a long time, um, and that you know is being is being supported by people who saw this as an opportunity to offer that project. I don't know many more details, um, but but that you know, that this this was developed in collaboration with a number of people who've been thinking for a while. Um, and then you know, is there a browser plugin to measure
by uh, being uh, a client that helps us collect data and feeds into those databases. And that when, once we have a comprehensive data set, that's also in terms of biases, we have gotten more of an idea of how we can address those. Um, then the NGOs and advocacy groups come in as well. So you know, advocacy, uh, I also encourage you to look at some of the reports that have already made some of the translation exercises, the technical data, and the policy implications that you can then use for your work. So our work really depends on how many of us come together to support this, and definitely a long-term effort. Uh, so if any of you have further questions, please come up to I'd just like to echo what Tim said, because I think it's really important that we see this research area as requiring a community and it's a new kind of community. Uh, the research has to be diverse. We need rigorous technical measurements. We need to bring people with expertise on that, many of which are joining me on the panel today. But we also need to look at the legal regulatory frameworks that requires law. We look, need a broad section of social science. We need uh, area studies. We, we had, for instance, a, a workshop that uh, Meredith and Colin and some others attended uh, in uh, last July uh, that we hosted where we tried to bring together a multidisciplinary group of researchers looking at information controls and I think we had like 22 different disciplines and departments there and that was really exciting but it's not just a, a research exercise, it's not just something happening in academia or with, uh, within the private sector and it really requires linkages of how can we turn research outputs into effective research communications that can have policy influence in the way that Shazad, uh, Daru and, and others that are here today have done and how can we do this together? And how can we try to take the importance of evidence-based research and, and try to make changes uh, with it? So really try to bring everyone together in, in a new community, I think is vital. Uh, and um, to both echo and uh, expand that a little bit, um, the other day in a panel, there was a, um, someone from the UK parliament was saying that uh, they weren't tec technical at all, uh, so how could they begin to understand some of the technical issues around some of the policies that they were working on? And I think what what is clear from this is there's an awful lot of work going on by a lot of people who are very interested in this forum, in internet governance, who do have technical know-how, who can provide that expertise and are willing to you know, work with non-technical people to try and uh, in, increase the amount of evidence-based work that goes into policy changes and policy work. Um, so I just hope if any of you out there can take that away as a message that you know there are technical people around and we want to see technical influence on policy. Yeah, uh, echoing what the previous speaker said, this, the, the only reason this research is possible because of thousands of volunteers to help us collect the data and we need more MLAB points, we need more ripe atlas probes out there that, that, that put data into the system for uh, these people to analyze. I think that I've been going to define success and define it as uh, because we've kind of given a process. If you're a developer, I think it's strongly important to consider the inclusion of the investment tool. If you have the opportunity to develop a platform or maintain a platform, a technical platform, this is an opportunity to and there are a lot of people on the stage that would be more than happy to nurse you through that process. And then secondly, I think that if we define success, success is based off of the localization of evidence. And while this is an international crowd, um, the, the less that I have, the less that the next iteration of this has an American on it in, in my place, uh, the more successful it will be. Uh, having local outcomes, local advocacy, and increasingly even local use of this data Defines what open data, free data is, is wh why it's important. And so I would stress that uh, anyone in here who's interested in developing a policy outcome in your home country uh, own this data uh, because I think it's, it's a lot more effective if, if you do it than any international organization. So I, I just really want to reiterate that localization is the most important thing. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I think, you know, I want to echo all of those statements. The you know, Masashi's emphasis on community and sort of multidisciplinary approaches to taking this data, taking all of the information we can gather, and you know, painting a picture of what's really going on. Because that's what this is about. This is about having evidence of what the 
truth and the reality of the internet and its impact in our lives is, um, and that is, I, I think, may require some multi-stakeholderism. Um, I, I drew that in there for you guys as the bingo card. Um, um, and, uh, and I also want to echo what Dominic and Colin and Marco were saying, um, and to turn it around a little bit, right? There are technical people to help the people who are working on policy. There are technical people who can help explain what the data means. But without your questions, without your requests, without the framing that you bring to the table, none of that will find its meaning. So we really need the participation of people who are non-technical, their voice, their input, their, their contextual information to, to create this whole picture. Um, and with that, thank you so much to everyone for being here, and thank you especially to the panel.